everyone to our small garden on an upliftingly sunny and crisp afternoon in mid-February. We are two amateur but enthusiastic plant addicts and wildlife lovers gardening in Kent, South East England. We had intended to wait a few more weeks before filming a garden tour just to give a richer sense of seasonal changes from winter to early spring. But even though there are only a few crocus flowers to admire so far and just the hopeful green leaf tips of Narcissi still on their slow motion skyward journey of emergence. The space felt so cheery today with early winter hellebores still flowering with their happy faces and nectar and pollen laden blooms alive with bumblebees and hoverflies. We felt it was a perfect time to share some sights, sounds and favourite flowers. And a few of the characters visiting the garden making us smile. Lady Killer is an exquisite crocus, definitely very seductive, but I can't help feeling it deserves a more elegant name. We love it in pots raised on the garden table, enabling us to appreciate its ethereal beauty at closer hand, although it's also gorgeous and impactful en masse naturalised in lawns. Our bulbs are planted in compost mixed with grit to emulate the drainage of the slopes of southeastern Europe through to Turkey, native lands of the species crocus chrysanthus. As you can see, these flower cups overflowing with pollen and nectar help sustain thirsty early pollinators. This bumblebee has bumblebee mites clinging onto her body, but that's no cause for concern as these particular kind of mites are just hitching a lift, hanging onto her thick hair. They are harmless and feed on pollen, wax and debris in the bumblebee nest. As these flowers begin to emerge, they seem perfectly paired with tuberous perennial anemone harmony pearl, hovering elegantly above them with generously sized petals, glowing with the same luminous qualities and similarly tinged with purple ink stains, pooling out from the attractive dark central boss. The species Anemone coronaria comes from Mediterranean regions and thrives in free draining soil and full sun. They are hardy for most of the UK but in containers are best moved to a sheltered spot over winter. They die back below ground level after flowering, with fresh growth emerging in autumn. As suggested by the species' common name, the florist's anemone, they make charming cut flowers. At dusk, when crocus flowers close back to candles, the glow of the open petaled anemone takes on a mysterious, levitational and magical personality. Another stunning early spring anemone that grows in the olive groves and diverse hillside grasslands of the Mediterranean, filmed flowering at Sissinghurst Castle last April, is Anemone pavonina. In its native habitat, it is often bright scarlet, but at Sissinghurst there are white, purple and pink forms to appreciate, all with a handsome dark purplish black boss in the centre of each flower. These petals are more star-like than the rounded forms of Anemone coronaria. It loves gritty, free-draining beds and sunshine, and as they establish, healthy plants should become more and more floriferous over time. Although they look at home in this environment of gravel-dressed beds and are very well suited to rockeries, they will also naturalise in grass reflecting their native grasslands habitat. Also growing at Sissinghurst is the Apennine anemone, a smaller spreading plant with deep blue starry flowers held above low cushions of finely cut leaves. Native to the woods, hills and forests of the Mediterranean, it is suited to sun or part shade.
This sunshine on a stalk crocus is orange monarch, just coming into flower. The first emerging layer of our bulb trifle, known as a bulb lasagna, which we planted back in October. The deepest layer contains tulip bulbs, which will be the last to emerge. These are the sweet scented beauties, Princess Irene. In the mid layer of bulbs, heavenly Narcissus minnow is planted its green leaf tips are beginning to make an appearance already. And the top layer that has just begun flowering attracting honeybees and hoverflies to the garden is pollinator pleaser, dazzling orange monarch. Lower level bulbs cleverly negotiate their growth around the bulbs above. However, if you're growing a single layer of bulbs in a container, you can pack them in even more densely. At the moment, as we await the opening of the remaining crocus buds, this is just a small taste of the spring trifle feast yet to come. This queen buff-tailed bumblebee has been active all winter apart from disappearing for about a fortnight in January. I'm probably guilty of having projected human emotions onto her, but I felt just how solitary, even lonely January must have been when there was not a single other bee flying around. And we also gained an appreciation of how tough she is, seeing her battle storm four scales to continue visiting flowers and take back pollen and nectar to bee larvae. Now there are smaller worker bees visiting the hellebores. I wondered at first if they had hatched from the queen's nest, but apparently once the female workers emerge, the queen bee does not leave the nest, but lays more eggs and remains inside. This queen flies with such speed and strength much higher than the house I can't imagine her ever stuck indoors. Pheasants are one of those iconically British birds seen strolling across the bare farmer's fields in winter with tangible confidence once shooting season is over. Or strutting around the land on posh country estates. But they are not British at all. They are native to Asia and possibly arrived here with the Romans. They are quite comical and seem to think that by hiding their heads, the rest of their body cannot be seen. In our garden, winter must be a disappointing time for the pheasants because the Welsh poppy seed they love to peck from the dried seed heads has long dispersed. The male birds look absolutely magnificent, but always slightly uncomfortable and a little ungainly, navigating the top of neighbouring roofs. Pheasants avoid the ventilation cover, whereas other birds will hop onto and over it. Why would this be? While male pheasants are highly sensitive to vibrations, so if the extractor fan is running, they could be sensing vibrations from the motor. There is anecdotal evidence that these birds can even sense preliminary seismic activity and sound an alarm by crowing before earthquakes. Here in Kent, in South East England, it is said that during World War I, pheasants crowed an alarm response to vibrations from the blasts of exploding shells at the Battle of the Somme across the Channel in France. And this is not so far-fetched when one considers contemporary accounts of walkers on Hampstead Heath in London 
both hearing the distant thuds of shells and feeling vibrations under their feet. English author Thomas Hardy described roosting pheasants as giant tadpoles when viewed from below, perched up in the branches of overhanging trees. And there is something tadpole-like about the rather adorable way they wiggle their tails as they take flight. portion of English supermarkets have recently come under criticism for blatantly flouting the so-called pester power rules, which are regulations to curb prominent displays and marketing of impulse foods at the end of aisles or at checkouts. But what about the pick and mix of plants, indoor and outdoor, that often surround supermarket entranceways? There are just such deliciously irresistible pots of spring flowers it's very hard not to put some in the trolley. They are often, very cleverly, that little bit ahead of your own homegrown bulbs, just to add to the temptation of immediate gratification. And they use the buy one, get one free psychology, which works even when you know that you could have bought 20 of them for that price if growing your own. And that, friends, is how we ended up coming home with bread, milk, cheese, eggs, and three pots of snake's head fritillaries. Up close, nature's skillful assemblage of petal marquetry in a burgundy pink and white pattern gives this perennial British wildflower an intriguingly mesmeric checkered design on its unique nodding lanterns. An elegant member of the lily family thought to originate in mainland Europe and Asia, its snake's head moniker probably refers to the buds nodding in the breeze on arched stems. flowering from March-April time to May in the wild. This plant favours damp riverside hay meadows, which sadly are one of the most endangered of UK habitats. It is though increasingly popular planted in gardens and looks wonderful spreading in undisturbed wilder or grassy areas, borders and rockeries. They are easy to grow but can be slow to establish the supermarket plant label suggests moist, well-drained soil, so incorporating organic material like compost to boost moisture retention without water saturation is a good idea, plus generous unobstructed drainage holes if planting in a container. And an eye on not letting plants dry out as they get established. One of the most beautiful sights right now in UK gardens and naturalised in the British countryside at a time when most deciduous trees are stark and bare and the landscape has not yet softened with spring's fresh unfurling leafage is the cherry plum, Prunus cerecifera. This small tree is sun-loving but will tolerate partial shade, exposed and windy sites and polluted urban environments. It will potentially grow to 8 metres or 25 feet, but can be pruned for a more compact form or grown in a generous patio container, which is how we would like to potentially introduce it to our own garden. This tree will thrive in any well-drained soil. Mature plants are useful for privacy screening in overlooked gardens, and it makes an attractive hedge often used as a shelter belt around orchards. The cherry plum may have a few thorns. I believe this can vary with the cultivar you choose. And amongst the different cultivars are gorgeous purple leaved forms with pink flowers, which can maintain their rich color from spring to autumn. Originating from Southeast Europe and Western Asia, it has been naturalizing in the UK from at least the time of the Stuart dynasty over 300 years ago. This characterful old tree that we discovered on a walk recently is not quite that aged, 
but must be around a hundred years old. The cherry plum is a wildlife food source for an extended season with the early emerging blossom attracting bees and in a good year an abundance of summer fruits for feasting birds. The cherry plum red or yellow summer fruits, called droops, which are not technically cherries or plums, are also used domestically in jams, winemaking or liqueurs. And bumblebees can definitely get a little pleasantly tipsy on the flowers. We filmed the February garden on a particularly sunny and gently breezy afternoon. But soon after our garden tour video last month, two major storms hit the UK, causing difficult and sometimes deadly conditions. This footage was taken on the blustery afternoon at the tail end of Storm Isha. It felt at the time as though calm was being restored and fine weather was surely on the way. But by the following day, Storm Jocelyn had come barreling in, creating further chaos. This made me reflect that without weather apps or news updates, I, and surely many of us, would be utterly unprepared to predict not only major weather events, but even less extreme weather changes that affect so many aspects of the garden. But how did the farmers and fishermen of times long past and all our ancestors survive without weather apps, TV meteorological updates, radio or newspapers to alert them of approaching weather. They relied, I suppose, on observations and knowledge of signs and patterns in the natural world, understanding plant responses like the opening and closing of petals, cloud formations or the behaviour of birds, which have an innate and acutely sensitive natural barometer in their middle ear detecting changes in air pressure. Today, we do, of course, still take note when birds suddenly fall silent. or when flocks seem to be flying lower than usual. Including the metal variety. And as the British Isles are predominantly affected by westerly winds, we do still adhere to the old adage, red sky at night, shepherds delight. Red sky in morning, shepherds take warning. But even with modern weather predictions at our fingertips, we find ourselves in times of changing global climate, when meteorologists grapple with uncharted territory. While scientists focus on the bigger picture, it feels more important than ever to understand and appreciate the beauty and rhythms of our own microclimates and immediate ecosystems. And by this, I mean our gardens, our patios or balconies, our doorstep flower pots or window boxes, being thankful for every contribution we can make to help a small part of the botanical world thrive, to cherish every nuance of knowledge and understanding we can personally gain about the plant life we cultivate around us, however modest, which in turn nourishes our hearts and minds. With every plant we tend and every insect and bird those plants shelter and feed, we are each writing our own small chapter in the vast story of flourishing life on planet Earth. Botanist James Wong reminds us that humans evolved alongside the botanical world and as such plant life has shaped every aspect of our culture, civilization, even our biology. Plants, he says, have made us human. So, 
next time any one of us comes home from the supermarket with an impulse plant buy or two amongst the cupboard staples. Remember, we have the perfect excuse. Plants made us do it. To everyone who supports, engages with and subscribes to Apple P Fern C, we and the bees, thank you. We hope you will join us again when the joys of spring are underway for our next garden tour. Until then, we wish you all flowerful times and nature-soothed minds. <laughs>